This presentation is made of uh, three parts. I will uh, introduce you some definitions and give you some context information. Then I'll show you how to interact with an open access uh, repository. And then on part three, I'll show you how to connect research objects, papers or documents with ORCID. And this and it will be clear why we asked you to create ORCID account. Okay? So, part one. Uh, when scientists do research, what they do, they apply a method that has been proposed for the first time by Galileo Galilei in, at the beginning of the 17th century. And this method is called scientific method. So you start from the, uh, 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 looking at the nature, you run experiments, you try to understand what's going on, and then you build theories. And this is common to all scientific disciplines. At the end, what scientists do, they write papers scientific papers, reports. And actually the onset of the first journals fully devoted to scientific papers marked what uh, people call the first scientific revolution. And this happened in the middle of the 17th century. The scientific method, this iterative procedure to understand the nature and measure the nature stands on two fundamental pillars, repeatability and reproducibility. So the possibility to repeat the uh, results of, uh, repeat an experiment or reproduce an experiment. And repeatability and uh, re uh, reproducibility are, um, uh, 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 I mean, are affected by the different kind of errors people uh, have when they measure the nature. So, one, one can ask if uh, science is really reproducible. And it turned out that people try to reproduce very important scientific papers, especially in medicine, in oncology, and they failed. So they, they tried to, to reproduce the results of uh, 50, 52 fundamental papers, and in 47 of these 52 fundamental papers, people were not able to reproduce the results contained in the paper. So, why this? For several reasons. So, most importantly, data is not available. Usually you have the paper, but you don't have the data that has been used to, uh, pr to, uh, to produce the paper. The software is not available. And maybe the methods, you don't have clear ideas about how the experiment described in a given paper is, uh, has been actually done. So the most important thing, as you can see here, is that uh, usually data is not available. You have papers, but you don't have the data. And the software is not available. But besides the repeatability and reproducibility, actually what you want to do is to reuse the experiment. If I could re, re, uh, 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 reproduce an experiment on climate change, for example, the, and if I could have the papers, the data, the software, everything, then I could reuse the data, maybe to tackle more complex problems. So if I could reuse data and software, I, and, and, and reproduce and the document, then I could uh, expand the knowledge and create new knowledge. So, if we look at uh, scientific computing, in the last 30 years, we evolved from uh, centralized scientific computing with big computers in the basements of uh, departments to a decentralized computing. We moved from cluster computing in the, in the 80s and 90s to grid computings, to grid computing uh, at the end of the last century and the beginning of this one. And then now we are moving to cloud computing.
distributed computing. And this has been possible because um, of the reduction of the cost of the hardware and the reduction of the cost of the networks. And at the same time, increase of the power of computers and increase of bandwidth of wide area networks. So uh, a new uh, term was coined um, um, at the beginning of uh, 20th cent the 21st century, the, the so-called e-science. What e-science is? E-science is science made with electronic infrastructures. So we have virtual research communities, scientists working together from in different countries of the world, and they want to access data and run applications and access instruments and sensors. And these instruments are, they are located in big laboratories. So to let this scientist to access the data, uh, people are trying to create what is called e-infrastructure, electronic infrastructure. So what an e-infrastructure is? All the computer centers, all the, big, the lab where these instruments are, are connected to the network through research and education network, like the Ethernet network. Okay, then on top of the network, on these sites, you install a special software that people call middleware. And this middleware let, be, let all these computers, all this uh, big infrastructure behave as they were just the one single computer dispersed over the network. So independent on where you access this e-infrastructure, you are able to access all the data and instruments everywhere else. So this is again the scientific method. Is this is but uh, is a is a uh, a little a, a little more complicated view of the first slide, and you can see that e-infrastructures are very important in this uh, in supporting the scientific method. So when it comes with the data analysis. High performance computing infrastructure, clusters, clouds, grids are very important. And also data preservation to store the data for subsequent reanalysis. But also data infrastructures. Data infrastructure is a combination of document repositories and data repositories. They are very important because uh, then with data infrastructure, you can access the data, not only your data, but everybody else's data to reuse, to reproduce science and to reuse data to tackle more complicated, more complex problems. But then you want also to connect existing data with new data that you have created. You want to link data. Then to link data, uh, there is an emerging set of standards that is called semantic web. I don't know if you are aware of the semantic web, but we will see something. So in, through the semantic web, you can connect data. So if you have uh, some environmental data, you can connect this environmental data with social data and maybe discover why people are moving, are migrating. So social data linked to environmental data will help you to create new analysis. But to do that, you, you need to access different kind of data and you need to link this data. So what people do is when they work on the scientific method, they go from, from the top to the bottom. You analyze data, you run an experiment, you produce your own data, you analyze your own data, you compare with somebody else's results, you write a paper, that's it. The real challenge is to go the other way around. I, found, I find a paper, then I can find the data that has been used to write this paper. I can find the software to, that has been used to analyze the data, and I can even find the infrastructure, a computer, a virtual machine, where all the software is installed and I can reuse it. So the challenge is to walk across the, no this, this is also called the knowledge path. I mean, instead of working from the top to the bottom, as people do usually, the challenge is to walk from the top, from the bottom to, I mean, both ways. Of course, to do that, 
you need to have access to all the, uh, the elements of the scientific research. And the paper is just uh, the last element. And this is why the lack of access to data and software, this is, this is, this is the reason why many uh, scientific results cannot be reproduced. So, there is a, an emerging concept that is called open science that tries to, open science is not, uh, you have heard maybe yesterday in um, uh, Bruce's presentation, open science is a scientific culture that is characterized by openness. So not only open access, but also uh, open data, software, and all the different aspects and stages of research processes. So if you want to know more on open science, these are two very interesting reports. One is a book, another one is a report where you can get more information on open science. So to open science is a recipe, and the recipe is open everything and try to share everything as soon as possible, as early as possible in scientific research. So to do open science, you should use open access to, to documents, uh, open data, but not only open data, as I said before, linked data, the possibility to connect data, open source, open standards. Only if you adopt open standards, the data can be in, uh, in, in, in interoperable. And of course, you need to have open educational resources to teach open science, but also to teach uh, normal subjects in an open way and make this educational resources openly available and reproducible. Online courses that are described in a way that they can be reused or customized. So Europe is, ve is, investing, is investing very much on open science. I mean, the European Commission is uh, putting a lot of effort and open science together with open innovation is seen as an uh, uh, enabler of uh, a better society and to increase and improve the economy. So what I want to show you here are connections. Open science is all about connections, sharing and connect. So I want to show here some connections. These are network connections. So these are network connections among the different parts of the world. And you can see the huge fast connection between Europe and North America. And very few with other continents. And you can barely see Africa here. Now the situation is going to improve with Africa Connect and Africa Connect 2. But still, there is a lack of uh, interconnection. I mean, fibers, links. But connection is also important in scientific research. So this is a map of scientific collaborations made of, made, uh, uh, built with authors of papers, scientific papers. So you can see how there is a lot of collaborations north-north, some collaboration north-south, but again, very few uh, uh, collaboration between South-South and North Africa. And this is seen also in this picture. This is a world map where each country is rescaled, the size of the country is rescaled by the number of papers in the Web of Science. Web of Science is a repository of scientific papers. And this is the number of in Web of Science uh, by authors living there. So this is the number of uh, uh, Web of Science paper in this country written by authors living in that country. So you can see how slim is Africa. Because many papers are written by uh, Africans living not in the, in the continent, moving somewhere. And this is a consequence. This is the, the, the world map scaled by the number of journals published there. And very few journals are published in Africa, and this is why you have very few uh, uh, papers published by African researchers in Africa. 
So there is a challenge. The challenge is make African science and African scientists more visible. And we have an opportunity to exploit e-infrastructures to, to do so. And the vision is to promote open science in Africa. If we promote open science and we promote the culture of openness and sharing, the, the uh, scientific products of African science, our scientists can become more visible. And African sciences themselves can become more visible. So, uh, you have already seen this. We are promoting open science. This is a, a Dakar declaration on open science. If you find some time, you can go to this page and uh, sign the declaration, this one. And uh, we set up this, the, the SciGaia platform, the, the big map. So, so what we, we want to do, we want to achieve with open science or with this platform is the following. So you are a researcher or even a citizen scientist you can search for a paper or for just for keywords and you find something on an open access repository but you also you are also all allowed to reuse or run analysis on the data belonging to the paper that is described in the open access repository. So you can run your analysis, you can extend the analysis, and you can produce new results. Then you can write a new paper, save the paper in the open access repository, and assign a digital object identifier to the paper. And connect the new paper with the, old, with, with the previous one, so that you can extend the knowledge. So this is the knowledge workflow that we want to implement. So open access. Open access repositories are powered by what is called digital asset management systems, which are intertwined structure incorporating software and hardware that take care of management tasks and decisions are surrounding ingestion, annotation, cataloging, storage, retrieval of digital assets. What a digital asset is? You have already heard this word in the G library presentation. A digital asset is anything that exists in a binary format and comes with the right of use. A picture, an image, a video, a, a data set, a scientific paper, Everything is a digital asset. If you have a system that allows you to manage digital asset, you have a digital repository. There are several, many actually, DEMSYS, Digital Asset Management System. This is a, a non-complete list. So I don't know if you are familiar with Fedora or DSpace or many others. These are, these, these are systems that allows you to manage, manage, manage uh, data. This is a link to other digital asset, di digital asset management system. YouTube is a digital, uh, digital asset management system. Instagram is a digital asset management system. Okay? So whatever you can upload, save, and share digital contents with a license to use. When you upload a video on YouTube, by default is the YouTube license. When you upload video or pictures on Instagram, look at the license, because people can reuse your picture, not even citing you and give you and acknowledging you. So it's very important not only to share data, but also to assign licenses to data and tell other people how and under which conditions they can reuse your data or your pictures. So in, we have uh, one task of the SciGaia project. I already showed this, this, uh, this uh, um, slide yesterday, where we aim at uh, uh, building data infrastructure in Africa, compliant with similar infra data infrastructures emerging and consolidating in Europe and other regions. So for this, we built 
what is called an open access repository. So before building it, because making a choice, so we set up some requirements. We wanted to have something open source, distributed under free license, deployable on a local infrastructure, standard compliant, well supported, and scalable. So we investigated several of the dances that you saw in the list before, and we, our, choose, our choice was Imenio. Imenio is uh, fully compliant with most important library standards. It's co-developed by CERN, the Particle Physics Laboratory at Geneva, and many other laboratories in the world. And Imenio uh, empowers several uh, flagship uh, open access repositories like Inspire, Scope3, and Zenodo. And there are initiatives promoted by UNESCO in Africa based on Imenio. So this is our, our choice. Well, uh, for this, I mean, first of all, we had a lot of knowledge about Imenio already instead of this space. Uh, with, uh, when we started, Imenio came with uh, an OIPMH endpoint. In this space, you need to enable it on purpose. And Imenio comes also with a very rich REST API. So you can interact not only manually, but also uh, uh, programmatically. So you can uh, have a portal uh, uh, talking with an open access repository. And of course, uh, there is uh, um, lots of uh, help that we can get from CERN. I mean, as physicists, we work at CERN, so we are in direct contact with the Imbenio development team. So the, the, I mean, when, we, when in the past we had some problems or with configuration, they, are, they, were, uh, uh, they helped us very much. So this is basically the, the, the intrinsic reasons. So our open access repository is uh, um, um, federated in the sense that uh, you can access it using the same credential that you got yesterday. So you got to credentials on IDP Open. If you go to this URL and click on Login, and you select Grid IP and IDP Open, you are in. So you can upload your own papers, or your own data, or your own images or reports, whatever. Uh, so papers can be man manually uploaded, or can be automatically harvested. So if you have data on a database, even if the database is on the web, nobody will know about this database. If you fetch it instead and put on the open access repository, and then this repository can be fetched by a search engine, then your data become more visible. And we added several add-ons. We developed some additional software for, um, for, uh, for Imenio. So, Imenio is fully compliant with standards. Our open access repository is uh, um, conforming with Open Archive Initiative. The Open Archive Initiative is a worldwide initiative to define standards and promote open access repository. So our Imenio here is one of the elements of uh, OAI. It's also a standard repository of Opendoor. Opendoor is yet another large worldwide initiative on open access. And our system here is a resource provider of uh, Open Door. So this is the knowledge workflow. And uh, using the open access repository and using the, uh, the uh, Science Gateway, we managed to enable this workflow and we demonstrated this workflow. I'll show you in a moment how we did this. But what's important is that um, if you have elements in a data set, for each element, you can assign a digital object identifier. It's a unique number that uh, 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 indicate the location and the metadata of a given paper. Then you can combine objects and you can create what we call research packages. So here, for example, we have an analysis of some data sets. We have the data, sets, data set itself 
and the we have the virtual machine containing all the software to analyze the data. So if you get all the three things, you can reproduce the analysis. Same thing, that's a paper on an on a agent-based simulation, and these are all the DOIs corresponding to all the elements to reproduce and then to reuse this analysis. And the SciGaia OAR is actually a research object. If you go to our repository, you get some instructions. We have a deliverable describing open access repository, and then we have a virtual machine containing a clone of the OAR. And so, so if you go here, and you can start downloading this virtual machine, you can create a clone of the open access repository. So you can create your own open access repository. And actually, Bihailu and Yosef came to Lagos in November, and we managed to create a clone of the open access repository for Ethiopia. And I will show this in the afternoon. So you already have one clone of OAR here, but you can get as many other clones as needed in the different universities, for example. We have eight clones of the SEGAI or OAR being deployed in Africa and in Europe. So now let's go to the more technical part and see how we can interact with the open access repository. So first of all, you can submit a paper, a data set manually. So you go to the, to the, you go to the, uh, to the, to the open access repository, you click on submit, and you choose what kind of resource you want to submit. And then you can submit in different categories. Because uh, we, we can host uh, data and contents belonging to different um, universities or to different groups and different teams. So we created a special category called Demo Hackfest that you will be using in the, in the, in the end zone. And using Demo Hackfest, you can upload your pitch. So you, this is the, the submission form. So first of all, you assign the DOI here. Then you say which kind of uh, documents you are going to upload, the title, the authors, the abstract, the language, the data, the, key, the, the, the keywords, so the, the additional metadata, the license, and the project this paper belongs to. So you can associate papers or data to projects. And maybe come back to your funding agency and show them how the, the, the money of the project have actually been used. So once you do that, you can put some references. You can browse here. You can choose your file to upload. You upload, and the, up, the file is uploaded on the open access repository. OK. You can also, uh, can do, you, 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 you can also do that for images. Same thing, a similar thing. And you can upload images. So papers, images, videos, multimedia content audio video recordings here. So you can upload their video lectures, for example. So not only uploading on YouTube, but uploading on your educational repository for people to download. And you can connect, for example, a video lecture with the, present, with the slides, with books, with exercise, and you say, this is an educational package, very much like a, um, a resource package. But you can also interact, and this is actually the most important part of this presentation, you can interact with the open access repository programmatically. So you can write programs that interact with the OAR. Interact means that you can upload contents and download content and search contents. So you can write your own uh, uh, you, you, your own application and save and retrieve documents from an open access repository. So we have uh, several kind of APIs, XML, JSON, and Python. These are some examples. So this is an XML API you can uh, uh, 
here you can get uh, the first 10 records in XML format. You issue this, this REST API and you can get uh, an, a JSON, uh, um, an XML, sorry, um, an XML containing the first 10 and then the second 10 and the third 10. You can download, you can browse the contents of the Open Access Repository. These are uh, different kind of things. You can, uh, uh, the first, uh, these are from 1 to 10, the first 10 elements, from 11 to to, I mean, from, uh, from 11, then 10. This means from 11 to, to 20. And from 22, for example, to uh, 31. Um, you can search also for um, strings. You can, you can find, a, you can search for a paper and you can search for the title. You can search per DOI and you can search per date. So using the API, you can uh, browse the open access repository and search your content uh, according to different um, selections. Uh, this is the output. This is, what you, this is what you get. So this is, you, are, you want to retrieve in XML format um, all the papers, all the contents of the Open Access Repository from the 21st of March 2016 and the, five, the 5th of uh, uh, July 2016. And this is what you get. So you can parse this and you can create pages that offer to the user a list of papers or a list of lectures or a list of any other kind of contents. So this is JSON API. So you get, uh, you get uh, the output in JSON format. Uh, you get a record from a given DOI, or you get records from, uh, for a given upload date. I'm going, I'm going quite quickly through these slides because you will be running a practical. Late, just after this presentation. So this is the output in JSON format. Uh, programmatic interaction, this is to get only the abstract title and authors. If you want to create specific lists. And this is what you get. Uh, and then this is the link to uh, help, uh, help documents where to um, get more information how to interact with the open access repository. Uh, in order to, to get authorized to upload documents, you should create a key and should give us a key, but uh, we will we'll tell you how to do it according to, the, to your use case. Uh, and this is are some examples using CURL Carl, some examples of how to interact with the APIs that I showed you before. And you will see how to do it actually practically after this presentation. Uh, this is Mark format. So if you want to upload, you have to customize, you want to, if you want to upload the documents, you have to customize an XML document in a specific format. We, we, we can provide you with some examples. And then you prepare this and using the API, you can upload your own content to the open access repository. Yeah, this is the XML with different tags, and we will explain you all the tags. This is, for example, the, the wall view. So you explain basically the DOI identifier, the date, first author, affiliation, country, the ORCID, the title of the resource, the abstract, so you fill this XML and then you have your own paper and when you call the API, the submission API, the, the, the content is transferred and all the metadata are written on the open access repository. And on 
the XML tags of this uh, bibliographic language called Mark, it's a standard actually, you can find on this link. Uh, then uh, the open access repository comes with an OEI PMH endpoint here. So you can even interact with the open access repository through OEI PMH. So you can harvest metadata. So you can create search engine or you can link. You can extract the data from this repository. You can extract the metadata from another repository and link them and create linked data. Okay, so this is for example, uh, um, using the OAI PMH API, this is what you get. You get the repository and then you get the information about, I mean, you, you get the metadata. You, may, you get the, the, the authors, the language, the identifier, the DOI, the resource identifier, the, the abstract, the title, and several other things. And then you can use this to create your linked data um, application. So that's, that's, that's it for the technical part. I will, you, will, you will be running, you will be doing, exercising yourself uh, in a moment for this OER. But I want to attract your uh, attention on a very important problem, how to provide authorship to research products, how to make African scientists more visible. So, the solution is ORCID. ORCID is becoming a de facto standard to assign unique identifiers to each researcher in the world. It's your own ID. So, there are more than three million ORCID IDs released so far. So you get an ORCID and you have already done this. Now, what you can do with this? You have to get uh, to connect DOIs with ORCID. You need to, you need to use uh, DOIs issued by DataSite. DataSite is an international non-for-profit organization in the world, and they issue prefixes. This is a prefix. This one up to here, ten dot fifteen one sixty nine. That's a prefix. Once I get the prefix, I can create as many sub-prefixes I want, and for each sub-prefix, as many DOIs I want. So DOIs are made of a prefix, sub-prefix, unique identifier. So what you get is a prefix. So um, DataSite has only one member in Africa that is a Earth Observation Organization in South Africa, but they don't have any policy to issue DOI prefix to non-South African organization. So I discussed with the conference of uh, directors of Italian universities. It's an association, and they are the, the Italian member in data site. So I talked to them, and we managed to have, uh, I, I, I mean, they agreed to issue prefixes also for non-Italian organizations. One prefix costs 200 euro per year, but then you can get infinite DOIs. So um, the African Population and Health Research Center, which is uh, uh, an African research organization located in Nairobi, and EcoConnect, one of the Nigerian research networks, they made a memorandum of understanding with the Italian, with the Conference of Italian Rectors. They paid this, to, they, 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 they signed this contract and they got the two prefixes. So now they can issue DOIs for all the universities, all the digital repositories in Nigeria and in Kenya. So to subscribe this agreement, it just need to fill and sign a document and agree to pay this 200 euro per year. But if you do so, for 200 euro per year, you can issue DOIs for all Ethiopian universities. And you can even ask them to pay back. So I'll show this in the afternoon. 
And uh, if you are interested, Dalai Lama, we can, I can show you this document, this memorandum of understanding. Thanks to this, I, because uh, I, of course I can offer you to use this uh, open access repository, but the rule is that uh, if the DOI belongs to a repository, the data should stay in the storage where the repository is located. So I cannot give you, I cannot give you this prefix for data st stored in Ethiopia. So now we have a, a clone of the open access repository for Ethiopia. I'll show in the afternoon. I think Bihailo will also show this because uh, uh, they develop this, they customize this. And uh, if you buy one prefix, then you are all done to create a digital repository with DOI. But that, let me show you the importance of DOI. So when you upload a paper or a report or a data set, you assign a DOI, okay? Then, yeah, this is what I wanted to say, that we can provide, we already provided uh, DOI, data side DOI prefixes to APHRC and EcoConnect, and they were the very first in the world continent. So, um, all records in the OIR can be claimed in the ORCID profile of their authors. How this works? You go to ORCID. Can you log in on your ORCID, ORCID profiles? You have the credentials, so you can log in. Once you log in, uh, one section of the ORCID profile is works, your papers, your works. Then you don't need to manually enter all your publications in ORCID. You can tell ORCID to search for you and automatically link. So these are the external sources of DOI, I mean, uh, pu pu publication servers, where you can search for your own publications. So one of these is data site. So you select the data site, and then you are redirected to the, to the data site search engine. Here, you put your ORCID ID, or your name. ORCID is very important. The ORCID ID, the main reason is to disambiguate the way authors are called in the publications. I'm called, I'm, my name is Roberto Barbera. In some publications, I'm Roberto Barbera. In some others, I'm R. Barbera. In some others, are Barbera Roberto. So there are many things, but all of them belong to the same ORCID ID. So I know my, uh, my ORCID ID. I know how I sign my papers, so I can search in the data site DOI catalog for my papers. So I search and I find this. You see? This is the Dakar Declaration. I'm, I'm one of the co-authors of the Dakar Declaration. The Dakar Declaration is stored on Saigeya. Saigeya Open Access Repository, and there is a DOI. And the same for all other papers. So I can say add to ORCID, and this paper will be automatically linked to my ORCID profile. So I can immediately populate my ORCID profile with documents, papers, datasets, software stored on the open access repository. And if I share with my colleagues, or if I put in my CV, my ORCID, I, my ORCID ID, everybody will see my publications. And my visibility as a researcher, as a scientist, will increase. So that's the big advantage of using an institutional repository and assigning the OIs to the to the, to the publications and link to the publication to ORCID. And this is why ORCID is very important. And this is why we asked you to create an ORCID ID. Because if you already have your thesis or some data or some report or some publications you are author of, you can upload on the open access repository, assign a DOI and link to your ORCID profile.
and you will become more visible immediately. So at the end, your CV will be your ORCID profile. Uh, another thing, I don't know if you have heard about altmetrics. Usually, um, the importance of a paper, a publication, depends on the number of citations. So if your paper is cited by several people, many people, I mean, this, the paper becomes quite important and your value as a scientist increases. The problem is that the citations are kind of slow. And citations are done in other journals. But you can become visible if, you, if your paper or your publication or your data set is debated on social networks or on blogs. So there is a new discipline called Altmetric. And there is a, a, a company managing Altmetrics. What they do? They just uh, browse all the social networks. They just browse all the blogs, the scientific the science blogs. And they look for citations of your papers thanks to the DOI. So if you cite your paper, mention or you, you tweet the DOI or your paper, this is tracked. And you get an altmetric alt counter. So in the open access repository, we automatically link the, paper, the documents or the data sets with altmetrics. And if you click on this, you can get who is mentioning you, who is citing you. And altmetrics are much quicker than normal citations because your, your, your publication can get cited immediately the same day it's published, while citations come later. So all this, all of you, to make your scientific product more visible, which was the, the challenge I mentioned at the beginning. So that, uh, yeah, at the end, you have a lot of references. At the end of this uh, presentation, you have a lot of references. Now, we can go here. You can follow this link, the same link. Okay, and you can log click on login and try to log in with your federated credentials. Once you log in, when, once you are logged in, you click on submit, you choose demo access, and you upload whatever you have on your local app, on your local computer. 